Throughout the years of my childhood, every Sunday morning, without fail, I found myself among the balcony people. <laughs> Balconies, you see, were not part of my life growing up, certainly not during the rest of the week. Like many Southern California families, we lived in one of those mid-century homes. Rooms were all on one level, no basement, no second floor, certainly no balcony. It was only on Sunday mornings when we left our home in the hills above Pasadena to drive those curves of the Arroyo Seco Freeway into the heart of the sprawling city of Los Angeles that we came to a balcony. The balcony which became a defining symbol of my childhood. This iconic balcony was found just south of downtown on the corner of 12th and Hope Streets, inside the first evangelical church, the place that was the spiritual center of my young world. First church was where my parents met and fell in love, and although they were Midwesterners by birth, they had come west during the 20s and the 30s, joining thousands of others who also arrived from someplace else to this rapidly growing city of Los Angeles. Now, the congregation was made up largely of people of Germanic heritage. This meant that the tenor section of the choir had names that sounded like my own. Names like Schneider, Schauer, Schweitzer, Schomper, and the list goes on. They would drive long distances to this home away from home, for those who, like my family, had left the Dakota farms and the small Nebraska towns behind them. But others came to the church as well. There were folk who came from the cheap walk-up flats, the residential hotels that were sprinkled through the surrounding neighborhood. All were warmly greeted as they arrived by my great aunt Clara who was a, a wonderful warm force to be reckoned with. She stood at the top of the steps and greeted everyone coming into the church. She was a one-person hospitality committee. As you walked through the doors of the church, you would find yourself in a worship space built according to what was called the Akron Plan, That's, as in Akron, Ohio. It was kind of a wedge-shaped church like a piece of pie with the little tip bit off the end. And at the tip, the narrow end, is where the pulpit was and where the choir sat. And then the pews were arranged in, in semicircles, out expanding into the rest of the building. Carefully crafted from wood, the church structure had lovely stained glass windows. It was completed by a graceful steeple that reached to the heavens. But for me, by far, the most important feature of the church was its curved balcony. And the people in my family, you see, were balcony people. <laughs> Each week we gathered for Sunday service as an extended family in the front row of that balcony. So that each week was a little, a little bit like a family reunion. My grandmother, my grandfather were there. My grandmother dressed in the latest fashion for someone of her advanced age and generation. My grandfather wore the three-piece business suit with a little Cecil Bruner rose in his lapel. There, too, in the balcony was an assemblage of aunts and uncles, great aunts and cousins. But both of my parents were not there. They were seated downstairs with the choir. And we smiled at each other across the church, knowing that I was both secure and well-supervised <laughs> upstairs with the balcony people. I want to tell when I was very young, we would sing the doxology every Sunday. And we would come to that line, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. And I thought that those of us on the balcony were singing to those poor, hard-of-hearing creatures seated below us on the church floors. I still smile whenever I sing to him. In time with the passing of childhood, I left that balcony, for the church on 12th and Hope Streets was sold. It was torn down to make way for a shirt factory. 
More years passed, I was off to college, then to seminary, and by that time, many of those who sat with me on that balcony had passed on into the larger life of God. And it was while I was in seminary, I first heard of a renowned Southern Baptist preacher by the name of Carlisle Marty, who had something to say about balconies and balcony people. I picked up my ears, and it circulated among the seminarians that he had once preached a sermon where, in fact, probably preached it four or five hundred times, where he referred to the people that are always there for us, and he called them balcony people. Every human being is like a house, he said. There are different rooms in the house that is you. There's a parlor where you welcome guests, a kitchen, a place where you're nourished, a place where you're fed, a place of fellowship. There's a bedroom in you, a place of rest, and perhaps a place of love. There's a basement where you store your trash. <laughs> now in my upbringing, he went on to say, there would have been a balcony on that house. Being a southerner, I see a white wrought iron railing in front. I see rocking chairs sitting on it, some ladder backs, some wicker rocking chairs. And I see people on the balcony drinking sweet tea or bourbon, depending on whether they were Baptist or Presbyterian. <laughs> Then recalling a passage from the letter of the Hebrews, where the author writes, We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Marty called those witnesses balcony people, those who, while no longer physically present with us, affirmed and had a positive impact upon us. And so many times on All Saints Sunday, I've shared this image with those in congregations I've served, and I offer it to you again on this All Saints. And with that, the question, who are the balcony people in your life on this All Saints Sunday? Who are the people you look up to in the balcony on this day? The ones who affirm you, those who left their imprint, deep upon your life. From time to time, I do an inventory of those balcony people in my life. They're my working collection of saints, those who've left their mark upon me. People who believed in me at crucial times in my life. And I always begin with that little church at the corner of 12th and Hope Streets. And along with my family, I think of Lillian Douglas, whose smiling, tanned face simply radiated acceptance. She was my Sunday school teacher and always embodied what I would later describe as a little glimpse of unconditional love. There was Ben Weiss. He was a retired high school principal, somewhat of few words, but a deeply spiritual man, a source of wisdom for all of the congregation, and he was the one that nudged me to the college that I later attended. And the church's minister, he's on the balcony, Reverend Gustafson. I'm sure he had a first name. I never knew it. He inspired me to the calling that eventually brought me to ordination and to standing in this place today. And also on this list are, 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 are quite a few eccentrics that make sermons. Well, we won't, you won't get them today, but <laughs> wonderful people who... I bring to mind that they are that great parade of saints that I watch and look to on this day. They refer in my first introduction to that phrase, the communion of the saints. Those who inhabit the holy city of God, the new Jerusalem, we heard about in the lesson from the book of the Revelation. And remembering those who have been the saints in our lives and those who have been saints in the life of the church here and elsewhere is essential work for remembering the saints ground us more deeply in our own humanity and renew within, renews within us a sense of divine purpose and that call that God has placed upon our lives. So along with belongings, which I spoke of last week, what we remember and who we remember serves to define who we are. The novelist and pastor Frederick Beekner writes about the place of remembering in our lives. He said, when you remember me, it means you carried something of who I am within you. That I've left some mark of who I am on who you are. 
It means that you can summon me back to your mind. It means that even after I die, you can still see my face and hear my voice and speak to me in your heart. There's some, though, that are suspicious of this focus on memory. They see that spending time remembering too easily becomes a matter of living in the past. But I like some words by Gary Wills in an insightful commentary on the Confessions of St. Augustine, who says the idea that living in memory binds us to a dead past assumes that the things in memory are unchanging, limited in their content, <coughs> to the point of their original acquisition. But Augustine saw memory as a laboratory in which we're continually refashioning everything that we remember, which is everything that we know. We can even remake ourselves in that crucible. Next week, I'm making a brief trip to Los Angeles. And while I'm there, I will make my annual pilgrimage. I do it each year to that corner of 12th and Hope Streets. It's one of the places I go to remember. On that site where the old first church used to be, even the shirt factory is now gone, all that's left is a little cafe with a large sign announcing huevos rancheros as the breakfast special. <laughs> but in my mind's eye, I can still see that steeple pointing heaven. And I can still imagine the balcony where I was first formed into a community of faith, strengthened to take on the challenges that life brings. And I can picture those who were up there on that balcony balcony with me, who were later joined along the way by others to become my spiritual balcony of the saints. So again, on this day I ask you, who are the balcony people in your life? Who are the ones who inspire you when times get rough to continue on with the journey? Who lifts your vision? Who steals your nerve? Carlisle Marney, that preacher, encouraged his hearers to wave to those who are on the balcony of their life. So I would encourage you today to look up. To look up to that balcony and see who is there. And as you look up, take a moment, just a moment, to wave and to give thanks. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. Amen. Amen.